Okay guys, welcome to the heart. We're going to start with some of the anatomy that we find on the external portion of the heart. We'll work through some basic terminology, basic anatomy. We'll look at the circulation that occurs in the myocardium as seen on, again, the outside aspect or on the epicardium of the heart. And then we'll work internally and then trace the flow of blood. So bear with us and bear with me as this is going to be, I expect, a long little tutorial. So. Let's start with what we see. So we have a nice big heart model that's going to uh, give us opportunity to see pretty much everything in good detail. And we start at this lower aspect of the heart. This is gonna be called the apex. And we look at the broad flattened portion this is gonna be called the base, okay? Now, as we keep looking through, we'll look at some circulation. We have all these shallow depressions that are gonna lie underneath these arteries and veins. These are all gonna be called sulci or sulcus. The sulcus is going to have our arteries and veins that are gonna feed blood to the myocardium of the actual heart. Remember, this is a muscle that needs a rich supply of oxygenated blood so that it can survive. You see all this yellow that's lying around and within and on top of these sulci is going to be adipose, it's gonna be fat, it's going to provide protection and insulation for all this vasculature. Okay, so let's look at some of these arteries and veins. We have, and if we see up here, this and this are going to be our two coronary arteries, our right and left coronary artery. Notice that it robs a little bit of blood from this aorta right here. So this is where we're gonna get our oxygenated blood for the actual heart muscle. Again, we're gonna rob from both sides of the aorta, right and left coronary arteries. As we drop down, we notice that we have this sulcus that's going to lie between the two ventricles. This is going to be called our anterior interventricular sulcus. Now aligned with that sulcus is going to be the artery. This artery is going to be called our anterior interventricular artery. Now the vein is going to have a different name even though it does lie in the anterior aspect. It's going to be called the great cardiac vein or the great cardiac branch. Also make a quick note that this anterior interventricular artery is also known as the left anterior descending branch or the LAD. Uh, typically during severe or massive heart attacks, it's this portion um, of the vasculature that will get clogged up with uh, plaque and cause a massive heart attack, also called uh, the widow maker. We're gonna pick this up and move our way to the posterior aspect we'll see that we have this huge swelling or bulge. This is the coronary sinus. Below it will be the coronary sulcus. We're gonna find some marginal branches on the side as well here. As we follow the coronary artery down, it will continue and change names to become the circumflex artery. We have on the posterior aspect here, this is again our interventricular septum. This will be our posterior interventricular artery. The vein has a different name. It will be called the middle cardiac vein, whereas in front it was called the great cardiac vein. Again, here are some of our marginal branches. As we follow our vein across, we have our small cardiac vein. And again, the depression underneath these structures will be the coronary sulcus. Let me get this back on its model. And we're going to continue through. I want you to pay note to this ligament right here. It is called the ligamentum arteriosum. In utero, it has a different name because it has a different function. It's called the ductus arteriosus. This is one of our three fetal shunts. Uh, we're gonna talk about two of them. Realize that this is one of them. Again, this purpose is to bypass the pulmonary circuit uh, when you're inside your mother's uterus surrounded by amniotic fluid. Okay, so we're gonna open this up. And we're gonna make our way into the interior aspects of the heart. And when we look at this, I like to start right here in the right atrium, as we're gonna find and isolate three basic dumping points. And when I say dumping points, I mean three places where deoxygenated blood, blood that's been used and abused by the body, uh, the head, the neck, the arms, the organs, are going to dump back into 
of this system, again, returning from the systemic circuit, to be reintroduced to the pulmonary circuit, to be reoxygenated. So a few things to note. One of our three dumping points, we have our superior and inferior vena cava. And if you look inside, you can see that big hole. And I'm gonna kind of turn it upwards so we can see the big hole up here where we're gonna have our two major conducting veins, superior and inferior vena cava. It's going to deliver blood, again, from here, head, neck, arms, and then everything below the heart is gonna return via this uh, conducting vein right here. Notice in here there is another uh, red and blue depression. This is going to be very important because again if we go to the posterior aspect of the heart you see the coronary sinus. Remember this is deoxygenated blood. Blood that's been used and abused by the actual myocardium has to get reintroduced into general circulation and it actually does it right here at this point. This is the coronary sinus orifice or that little opening from the coronary sinus. When that sinus fills with blood it will push and squirt into this large and massive chamber. Number 55 right here, if you look right here, that little white depression is our second fetal shunt. This is called the fossa ovalis. Again, in utero, it is known as the foramen ovale. It is a hole that will link, link both left and right atriums. Again, the purpose of these two shunts is to bypass, again, bypassing the pulmonary circuit. This way we can get oxygenated blood um, to the heart, to the baby's body. Uh, when the lungs are not physically functioning. If we look at this textured portion of the right atrium, these are called pectinate muscles, and they're attached to the auricles, auricle for ear-like structure. This gives the right atrium and the left atrium both uh, a little extra volume uh, and also will assist in the downward force generated to push the blood through uh, that tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And so these are pectinate muscles. This is, again, ground zero. This is where we start circulation at the right atrium. Now this structure is going to squeeze and it's gonna push blood through our first AV valve or atrioventricular valve known as the tricuspid. Some structures to pay note here are going to be our chordae tendineae. These are gonna be our tendinous cords that are gonna to attach to those leaflets that are gonna open and close, and again, prevent prolapse or this valve kind of blowing back, and again, preventing uh, retrograde blood flow. They're gonna be attached to these big bulbous muscular structures known as papillary muscles. Now, like the atrium, we have this textured material framework that is gonna line and make up the endocardium. This is gonna be called our trabeculae carnae. And again, trabeculae, we saw trabeculae before in bone, like a meshwork or network. And this is gonna be on the inside of the endocardium. Remember, we have three basic layers here to the heart. The innermost layer being the endocardium. Again, smooth, so that red blood cells will not rupture as it moves up against it and flows up against it. We have our middlemost layer of the myocardium. Okay, myo for muscle. And then our outermost layer known as the epicardium, which is gonna be fused with the visceral or innermost layer of the pericardium. Okay. Once blood fills this chamber, it's gonna push and we're gonna hit our first semilunar valve. This is gonna be called our pulmonary semilunar valve. It's gonna move via the pulmonary trunk and it's gonna start our pulmonary circuit. We're gonna send blood via the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. They're gonna oxygenate, do its magic and gonna return via our pulmonary veins. Now, a quick thing to note here, and this is always a good question come exam time, is typically and generally when we're looking at models and pictures, arteries are always denoted as being red and veins are always denoted as being blue. Again, not signifying the color of blood that flows through the body because we know that blood is red uh, regardless of whether it flows in veins or arteries, but to make it simple on models, we usually denote veins as blue and arteries as red, except for here. Here's that role reversal where arteries are gonna be carrying deoxygenated blood and veins are gonna be carrying oxygenated blood. Okay, so as blood returns from the pulmonary circuit, it will dump into this right atrium. Left, left atrium. atrium. See this nice textured pectinate muscle, and then external anatomy, the oracle that makes up that left atrium. I'm sorry, left atrium. This is going to squeeze, and it's going to push through our second AV or atrio, atrioventricular valve, which is known as the bicuspid. Okay, also known as the mitral valve. 
Again, it's going to be connected by these chordae tendineae to the papillary muscles. The left ventricle is a massive structure. Pay note to the thickness of the myocardium. It is almost five times as thick as compared to the right ventricle. And the reason why the left ventricle is so much thicker is because it has to be able to generate enough force, enough pressure to push blood up through that aortic semilunar valve. Okay, so that's our second semilunar valve. And again, aortic, because it's going to the aorta. And again, producing enough pressure to send blood to the head, the neck, the arms, and continuing down throughout the remaining portions of the body. Okay, so that pretty much concludes the anatomy of the heart, internal, external, and flow of blood throughout. Thank you and keep watching for some more tutorials.